Germany's political crisis spreads beyond its frontiers as Austria declares it is ready to protect its borders from migrants. A team of Ugandan scientists win top honors for their malaria rapid testing kit. And the last African team booted from World Cup raises concerns. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. As the European migrant crisis simmers, Austria announced Tuesday that it is ready to implement unspecified border protections if Germany enacts a set of stricter immigration controls it, its government released on Monday. Austria says it's prepared in particular to take measures to protect its southern border, uh, which include those with Italy and Slovenia. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel's ruling party is advocating a more welcoming stance, while her Bavarian coalition partner is calling for stricter controls over who is allowed into the country. Merkel and the uh, Christian uh, Social Union leader and Interior Minister Horst Schäfer uh, both say they have agreed on a plan that works for both sides. The agreement calls for establishing transit centers to hold asylum seekers while their cases are being evaluated. If the migrants are found to have already applied for asylum in a different European Union country, they would be sent back to that country or to Austria, pending agreement with the Austrian government. Meanwhile, in Malta, for the second time in a week, authorities have detained a humanitarian vessel. Now, the Sea Watch 3 normally rescues migrants off the coast of Libya. Last week, the humanitarian ship Lifeline was detained after Malta opened its port to 230 migrants. Italy had denied the ship safe haven. The Sea Watch 3 is operated by a German charity. The vessel's spokesperson says they had requested to leave port after undergoing maintenance, but the port authority had refused. Malta's port authority says the vessel's status is under review. Sea Watch head of mission, Jan Chile, insists they are being blocked without any reason. The Maltese government is basically stopping us from saving lives at sea at the moment. So there have been 63 people dying yesterday. There have been more than 100 people dying on Friday. We are like kind of the only really well-equipped rescue asset at the moment available. There are no other NGOs at the moment because they're all blocked, all had to go to different ports. Um, so they are basically risking people drowning in the Mediterranean Sea at the moment. Italy's far-right interior minister says the rescue ships are colluding with Libyan smugglers, a charge that has never been proven in court and denied by the rescuers. Last week, Malta said it would no longer provide logistical support to vessels under the suspicion of acting illegally. The immigrant from Mali dubbed Spider-Man after he's killed a Paris apartment building to save a young boy dangling from a balcony has started to work for the city's fire department. 22-year-old Mamadou Gassama captured international attention when he scaled four stories of a building's interior exterior to save a four-year-old boy who had managed to climb over a balcony and was perilously dangling above the street. President Emmanuel Macron suggested Gassama pursue the job as a firefighter after recognizing him for his heroics. Macron, who has supported a bill to tighten France's immigration law, has said there is no disparity between rewarding Gassama for his act of bravery and holding firm on immigration. Now, Yeni Gonzalez of Guatemala crossed the border into the United States illegally and was separated from her children. VOA is following her quest to overcome legal barriers to get her kids back from distant detention centers. As VOA's Celia Mendoza reports from Arizona, this is one case among the 2,000 children of illegal immigrant migrants separated from their families. After 43 days in the custody of U.S. immigration authorities, Jenny Gonzalez was released on bail. She had been separated from her three children on the southern border of the United States when they tried to enter the country without legal documents. She spoke with the Voice of America when she left the migrant detention center in Illinois, Arizona. I'm going to look for my children. It has been very difficult, very hard for me. I felt that my heart broke into a thousand pieces. They snatched my children from my arms. 
For five weeks, Gonzalez was detained in this immigration center, 3,800 kilometers from New York, where her three children were sent. Gonzalez was a straw. I asked them to please give me a call, and they said no, there were no calls. And I told them, please, I want to know for my children that I already have days of not knowing about them. And he said, do you know something? You will be deported to Guatemala and your children, he told me, will remain in the hands of this government. In a VOA interview, Jenny says she was unaware of the zero tolerance policy that separated her from her children. She says if she had known, she would never had brought her children this way. They are now in New York under the care of the Cayuga Center. Donations made it possible for Gonzalez to be released on bail. The bail was paid by some families, mothers who were in New York City. And thank God they sent me by text message confirmation it was paid, that the bail of $7,500 was paid. Gonzalez's departure coincided with First Lady Melania Trump's visit to Migration Processing Center in Tucson, Arizona. Trump is closely following the situation of these undocumented families and the work of the authorities. I'm here to support you and uh, give my help, whatever I can, for behalf of children and the families. The Trump administration says it will reunify families, according to the head of the Department of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar. They would be unified with either parents or other relatives under our policy. So, of course, if the parent remains in detention, unfortunately, under rules that are set by Congress and the courts, they can't be reunified while they're in detention. Gonzalez is looking forward to hugging her kids very soon. Celia Mendoza, VOA News, Eloy, Arizona. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Still to come, Africa 54. An uninvasive malaria test wins a team of young Ugandans an engineering prize. But first, a look at Tuesday's headlines. In Cameroon, a large fundraising event takes place for the victims of conflict between the military and English-speaking separatists. In Zimbabwe, campaigning is in full force ahead of the July 30th election, which will be the first without former president Robert Mugabe. In Mauritania, the African Union holds a summit with French President Emmanuel Macron to discuss a joint G5 Sahel force. The French immigrant from Mali who scaled a Paris apartment building to save a young boy dangling from a balcony is now working for the city's fire department. Finally, in Tunisia, Swad Abdelrahim makes history by being elected the first woman mayor of Tunis. Well, it's time for a health report, and joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Madu with the latest news on diabetes. Lino. That's right. An eight year study has shown that the Bacillus calamine guerin BCG vaccine against tuberculosis can reverse type 1 diabetes to almost undetectable levels. United States researcher found that just one shot, followed by a booster four weeks later, brought down average blood sugar levels to near normal within three years, and the effect lasted for the following five years. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease where the body attacks cells in the pancreas which produce insulin. Insulin is needed to move sugar from the blood to cells where it is used as energy. Used for almost a century to prevent tuberculosis, the team say BCG speeds up the rate by which cells convert glucose into energy. The new study involved 52 people with type 1 diabetes. The report was published in the Telegraph UK. 
Researchers in Japan say kids exposed to tobacco smoke in the womb and early in infancy could have doubled the odds of developing hearing loss compared with children who were not exposed to tobacco at all. The researcher examined data on over 50,000 children born between 2004 and 2010 in Kobe City, Japan. Overall, about 4% of these kids were exposed to smoking during pregnancy or infancy, and roughly 1% had tobacco used during both periods. They assessed children's hearing using a whisper test, during which mothers stand behind their kids to prevent lip reading, then whisper a word while the kids has one ear covered. The study found 68% of the children were more likely to have hearing loss if they were exposed to tobacco during pregnancy and 30% more likely if they inhaled a secondhand smoke during infancy. The researchers suggest a woman should quit smoking before they become pregnant or as soon as they discover they are pregnant. Now, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime has released the 2018 World Drug Report, which states that global drug markets are expanding as cocaine and opium production worldwide has hit absolute record highs. The 2018 World Drug Report provides a global overview of the supply and demand of opiates, cocaine, cannabis, amphetamine type stimulants, and new psychoactive substances as well as their impact on health. It highlights the different drug use patterns and vulnerabilities of particular age and gender group and highlights the shift in the global drug market. The report found that cannabis was the most widely consumed drug in 2016 with 192 million people using it at least once and opioid overdoses caused some 76% of drug related death. Yuri Fedotov is executive director of the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. Non-medical use of prescription drugs has reached epidemic proportions in some parts of the world. The opioid crisis, in particular the use of fentanyl and its analogs, has contributed to a 21% increase in the number of drug overdose deaths in the U.S. to more than 63,000. And the executive director of the UN Office of Drugs and Crime adds that the impact on young people is especially worrisome and stresses the need for more action on prevention, treatment and rehabilitation. Now, a team of six young Ugandan scientists won a prestigious engineering prize for a non-invasive rapid testing kit for malaria they hope will one day be widely used across Africa. The award by the Royal Academy of Engineering in Britain comes with nearly $33,000 in prize money. VOA's Maria Magello reports. The reusable kit is known as Matibabu Swahili for Medical Center. Its inventors say it can diagnose malaria in less than two minutes. We are trying to bridge the gap between communities and the rightful access to malaria diagnosis. Matibabu uses a light sensor instead of blood samples. Team members Shafiq Sekito and Brian Gita explain how the device works. When a person is infected by malaria, the parasites in the blood change their chemical and physical properties. They change the shape of the cells and uh, there is a crystal that's emitted in the bloodstream. So we use light and magnets to differentiate between uh, the blood that's infected and the blood that's normal. Holding still for two minutes, uh, the patient leaves their finger into the curvature for the device. And uh, as after the, the sampling, the results are sent to to, to, to the laptop or to the phone to show whether you have malaria or not. The head of the Uganda National Drug Authority says this is a very promising development for his country, making it more likely that patients, particularly children, will use it. Malaria is one of the major killer diseases in Uganda, and I think if this innovation is taken on board, one, it will not hit, it will not hurt the children. The new test could be a game changer that helps reduce costs, but a physician at Nakasero Hospital in Kampala cautions that the device must be very accurate to be effective. When we look at uh, medical tests, we, look, we have something called sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity means 
how likely is this test able to detect someone with malaria? Yes. Uh, usually we want to aim for something above 95 percent yes um, the developers have talked about 80 percent 80 percent of the world's malaria cases and deaths occur in sub-saharan africa officials and scientists hope this new test may reduce those numbers maria magialo voa news that's our health report for today to stay in touch find me on twitter at lenor modu vincent back to you well, thanks a lot, Lino, and I'll be sure to watch Lino Medu's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. Well, Senegal's national football team returned home from the World Cup last week after losing to Colombia and becoming the first country knockout. Uh, knocked out under new rules on discipline. Senegal's defeat means all five African teams have been eliminated from the World Cup's knockout stage for the first time since 1982. No team from the continent has made it to the second round. Sophia Christensen reports on the disappointment in Dakar and the performance of African football teams. Senegal's football team was knocked out of the World Cup in Russia under a new tiebreaker rule on discipline called fair play. We are so disappointed. We really wanted Senegal to win this match. It really hurts. Nicknamed the Lions of Taranga, they are the first country to be eliminated over discipline and the last of five African teams to exit the competition. Retired footballer Mbai Bachi blames limited funding and lack of practice for African teams' poor performance at the games. Look at Argentina, Brazil, France, Spain. These are all teams with experience. They each have at least five players who already participated in a World Cup. Hopes were high for Senegal after it defeated Poland and tied with Japan, despite the loss to Colombia. But under the fair play rule, Senegal is eliminated for having more yellow cards than Japan. Senegal's Football Federation has asked FIFA to reconsider the new regulation, which some argue does not accurately judge a team based on their skills. Technically and physically, Africa is ready, and I still trust we will be able to achieve something in the years to come. The defeat in Russia is only the second time Senegal qualified for the World Cup. In 2002, they shocked the world by defeating France in the opening game and going all the way to the quarterfinals. Senegal's football fans maintain high hopes their players can one day get there again and perhaps make a drive for a World Cup title. Sophia Christensen, for VOA News, Becca. Well, for more on, uh, on, the Africa, on Africa in the World Cup, I'm joined by two of my colleagues. Mohamed El Shinawi, who recently returned from Moscow, where he watched the matches up close. And, and Drahman Dia was in Dakar when Senegal lost to Colombia. Gentlemen, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. So I want to start with you, um, Abdurrahman. In fact, uh, how was it like uh, first before Senegal played Colombia? And then what happened after? Well, after the draw against Japan, uh, people were starting to question the team. Like they were very hopeful after the first game when they won against Poland. And then the draw came with Japan. Uh, so people were starting to, to lower expectations and saying, well, you know, anything could happen. Everybody were hopeful that they could go on to the next round, but they were starting to say, you know what, anything could happen because we, we lo lost the opportunity to win against Japan. Yeah. And, you know, what many were fearing actually happened with Colombia. They were not able to, to at least have a draw. To, to make it to the next round. So there was a lot of disappointment. And people then actually took it with philosophy to, yeah, to, yeah they, you know, especially after yesterday's Japan game, uh, which did very well, people were saying, you know, after all, you know, everybody is good when you yeah. go to the World Cup. Yeah. So I mean, we need to really accept well. that. Yeah. Exactly. So, Mohammed, you were there, man. I wish I was in your bag, the traveling bag, because uh, how was it like being in Moscow? Well, being with the fans yeah. was quite a different experience because the last time I watched uh, World Cup was covering 
for the Voice of America as a correspondent in 1990 in Italy. But being with the fans, whether in the stadium, in the first fan, in uh, Moscow Strip where everybody's mingling, it was quite a different yeah. experience, especially that the Egyptians were in large numbers. Yes. I was watching the uh, Egyptian team, of course, and the estimated number of spectators uh, uh, is between 15 and 20,000 Egyptians. Wow, and, and you know, that shows you the expectation that was there. So from uh, what you were hearing, what happened with the Egyptian team, for example, one of the African teams that is out? Well, the Egyptian team is like most Arab and African teams. They rely on one or two players, and they are not playing as a group. Unlike France, France has stars, but they play as a, a team. Yeah. So they relied heavily on the second game on Mohamed Salah and even the coach, the Portuguese coach yeah. of the Egyptian team said Mohamed Salah is a, a very good player but he needs a team and that was the problem. Yes. Now, uh, Abdurrahman, looking overall, I mean this is the first time as we mentioned since 1982 that there's no African team that went beyond that stage. I mean, what were you hearing? Is it to do with uh, continental and preparedness or was there something to do perhaps with uh, uh, people taking things for granted and assuming they will get there anyway? It could be all of the above actually because individually they have very good players. They all play in Champions Leagues, the best you know leagues in Europe. Uh, but if you put them together as a team, they always have issues and some are saying you know they didn't have enough time to prepare. Others were saying there might be personal issues. Um, I remember in Senegal, before the World Cup, there was a lot of controversy on the choices that the coach made, uh, Alucisse. Uh, but then, you know, people came to understand his choices. But, uh, you know, they were less forgiving when actually they lost. It was all on him. And they think that because he didn't, he wasn't able to put together the best team uh, together. So. Uh, it's all of the above, but in my personal view, um, they need to work hard to, to get local players uh -huh. and not always rely on those who play Professional. in, in Professional. Europe. Yes. You know, they need but local championships yeah. exactly. in order to, to do better. Build, build uh, the, uh, the talent at home and just right. uh, don't rely on guys coming back. Right. They do, but yeah. they, always, they always send them to the you know, European down, leagues. They go, yes. Right. So, Mohammed, uh, first, um, I see you have your ticket here, you have your, your ID. How was it uh, even just getting to Moscow, getting to the venue of the, of the game? Well, they were very strict and organized about going to the gate and show the fan ID, mm -hmm. and then they would scan it, and you show the ticket, they would scan it. If they are not corresponding to each other, you are not allowed. Wow. Uh, then, if you have a banner, which I had, a banner for Mohammed Salah, yeah. and uh, the guard said, you have to show me what is written on it, and it was in Arabic, the best player in yeah. English team, uh, English uh, league, and then he said, this is, I need a translation, and luckily, I had translation in Russian, English, and Spanish, and after he saw it, he said, excuse me, because we don't allow any racism, into the, <laughs> so that. So that, that, that was very interesting. Now, Abrahman, uh, in, in terms of uh, the future of the continent, I mean, what do you think are the lessons that could be taken from the really poor performance of all the African teams and including those that didn't even make it in? Mm. They need to understand that everyone is doing better and they cannot uh, stay behind. If they want something, they just. Uh, the, Governments in, in, in Africa, they put a lot of money for these teams to go to, to the World Cup. And in return, they expect, you know, all this uh, joy from the people. And, you know, it does calm down the pressure. And I was interviewing one friend who was saying, you know, during World Cup, we forgot about politics, all these controversies. So it does add a lot of positive vibes to yeah. the countries. But in exchange, they need to work harder and, you know, be at the international level just like the other teams they cannot just go there mm -hmm. just to participate it is important to participate yeah. but they need to up their games as well and Mohammed, what do you think and including also this uh, protest over the discipline uh, kind of close now uh, the rule of uh, being disqualified or losing by discipline actually uh, 20 26 
would be a golden opportunity for African and Arab teams in Africa to shine because they will increase the number of participants from five to nine. But between now and then, we have to adopt a different approach to prepare the national teams in Africa because out of frustration, fans said something very funny uh, in Moscow. They said FIFA is F-I-F-A. It stands for football is not for Africans or Arabs. But uh, the truth is, we got to up our game ourselves. We have a lot of talent, and I think it behoves on uh, the African uh, governments and countries to support young talent, and hopefully we'll do much better in the future. Thanks, gentlemen, for joining me today. Thank you for having us. All right, and we look forward to that. Mohammed Abdurrahman, Mohammed and Abdurrahman, uh, Voice of America reporters, and thank you for giving us this fine analysis. Well... Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. New technology could turn the saying, seeing is believing on its head. So-called deep fake videos use facial mapping and artificial intelligence to produce videos that appear so genuine, it is hard to spot the fakes. Deep fakes are so named because they, are, uh, they use deep learning, a form of machine learning. The computer program learns how to mimic that person's facial expressions, mannerisms, voice and inflections. Politicians, intelligence officials and others worry that these bogus videos could be used to threaten national security or interfere and manipulate elections. Well, next up, future tennis stars could potentially avoid months of sidelining following an injury with the help of motion capture technology. That's according to biomechanical experts from Britain. Using 3D optical tracking equipment similar to that used in Hollywood film production and then applying their own computer algorithms, the team from Coventry University can measure the loads imposed on the body's joints, bones and muscles. This data can then inform training methods to help improve player technique and avoid injury. The Coventry University team have pre previously demonstrated the Bob software to highlight the loads uh, placed on the body during activities as varied as dancing, gardening, and even getting in and out of a car. Well, and finally, Ambosella's youngest residents are settling into life with their hard at uh, Amboseli National Park in Kenya, now two months old. The twin elephants stay close to their mom and big sister for safety. The male and female twins were delivered at the end of May during the rainy season by a 39-year-old Paru, their mother who belongs uh, to a herd of 40 elephants. Uh, had, uh, according to the Kenyan Wildlife Service, a twin birth is a rare occurrence. Last happened in 1980 when another pair of twins, Equinox and Eclipse, uh, were born and that's what's trending and that's our show thanks a lot for watching have a good night Welcome to English in a Minute. A lot of American English idioms refer to parts of the body. Get off on the wrong foot. Are Anna and Jonathan having trouble learning a dance? How did it go meeting your girlfriend's family? Well, it was uh, interesting. First, I was really late. Oh, Jonathan. Yeah, and then at dinner, I spilled my water all over her